Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're gonna paint a or attempt to paint a Seraphon army in 24 hours. Will we make it? Who knows? Am I recording this after I've already completed everything? Maybe. It's hard to say. You don't know. Uh, but at any rate, that's what we're going to do. And a couple quick notes. Uh, you're going to see me go through a lot of different video on my process here. Uh, some things I narrate over, some things I'll talk over the actual process where apropos. Uh, in any case, uh, obviously throughout there, there's a lot of hours you're not seeing. I think that's probably obvious. Uh, also about what we're, what I am capturing in that 24 hour window. Uh, I didn't count any of the priming work or the prep work, although I am going to show you some of the prep I did beyond just a standard Zenithal, uh, to make it easier for me to then paint. I also did the bases completely separate. Uh, so, you know, all in, this is probably actually more like a 48 hour project when you consider the bases and the prep and stuff for everything, but the goal here is to paint the army in, in a day, in 24 hours. Uh, that 24 hours is spread out over a three-day period, over a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, so that's, I do sleep <laughs> a little bit in the middle here. Uh, I can paint for a long time. I cannot paint for 24 hours straight. So that's the setup. I'm going to take you through how I attack speed painting challenges like this, where you've got a lot of figs and you want to get them on the table fast and you want them to look decent. Uh, so that's what we're going to break down. So with that, let's get right into the video. Okay, so we're going to start off here with a little all over wash of Agrax Earthshade. Uh, obviously, this footage is sped up because I don't think you care that much about what I'm doing, but I'll just talk about my prep process. So I started with an all over uh, light brown, basically to prime them. And then I went with a, a sort of... Uh, pretty ivory color like a fairly bone color from a 45 degree angle and from above then i took some basic white mixed it in and shot it from 90 degrees so that was my sort of zenithal scheme now these guys have a lot of texture so i wanted to bring a lot of that back out hence giving them a nice agrax wash once that's done then the goal was to uh add some detail and some texture back in so we took some pale sand which is a nice uh sort of mid ivory and we just gave him a good all over dry brush focusing on dry brushing down and the upper parts of the miniature to really bring out all those scales those ridges those detail for the later steps all right so now it's time to head to the airbrush booth and we're going to start with a, a thin coat of contrast paint so we're going to use some griffhound orange uh, this is thinned one to one with my traditional mix of thinner and flow improver just going to kind of hit them all over contrast paint is great for this kind of a base color step because it's so naturally transparent it just makes it easy it flows through the airbrush smooth it thins down wonderfully and most importantly you see how it's preserving a lot of those darks uh, the next thing i'm going to do is grab an ivory color in this case this is just ivory from pro acryl thin it way down so this is maybe four to one with thinner to paint and I'm gonna just go and re-add in some spot highlights so that way we up that contrast. Hit things like the side of his head, the top of his back, those areas that I really want to be popped out to be catching the light, he's in a very hunched position. Once that's done, we then make up a mix of Chimera Colors Orange and Cold Yellow with a little bit of Flame Orange Dollar Rowney ink. And we thin that way down six to one with thinner and we're just gonna kind of give that a quick uh, all over coat to enrich and rich yeah to make the orange look more orange <laughs> that's what we're doing this is a more traditional orange color and it'll give us a lot more variance and it really brings out the contrast in this guy so uh that's what we're doing on this step now we can't stop there so once we get that covered up then our next step is going to be to bring back in add some more yellow to the mix so i added some warm yellow from chimera colors thinned down just the same, and then I go ahead and build that in as a higher highlight. All right, so I'm two hours into the 24-hour army project, uh, two hours and 12 minutes to be specific, and we've made some good progress. So everything is orange, uh, and there'll be pictures and stuff you'll see. Everything is 
is orange. You'll have seen the video to get to here. Obviously, there was a lot of airbrush layers. I have the clock paused at the moment. I'll, I'll interject every so often to do these little updates. Um, so this was a lot of, of different layers and stuff to get a lot of nuance in there. Orange is a really tricky color, and I wanted to take the time with the airbrush. So now, though, we've gone as far as we can go with the airbrush. But two hours out of the 24 to get, you know, good coverage on a majority of the model and a lot of solid base coats with still good gradients down, I feel like was a good use of time. So at this point now, we're going to move over to the desk and uh, we'll see what we can do from there. We've got a lot, of, lot more to do, but uh, we're, you'll see how we attack it. Uh, I'm pretty confident at this point we'll get to the, the full project uh, and we'll get everything done within the 24 hour span. But only time will tell so back in just a moment all right so as mentioned we're a little over two hours in we've got a bunch of orange dudes they're very orange here they are so orange uh so now it's time to add some other colors to it but of course my palette uh is all set up i've got my other i've got all the other colors i'm going to use because what i'm going to do is go one by one and hit all the other elements uh that are non-metallic so some of these guys have metallics on them when they do uh, I'll come back and do that last. That's just so I can seal them before I put metallics on there. Um, but the, and I'll, I'll roll the colors up on the screen as I, as I go through them. But as you, as you probably noticed, I, um, I also uh, went ahead and uh, whitened the sort of, you know, the hands and the tummy up a little. And that's so I can then go in and rebuild some colors. Because I have the same orange and yellow mix that I used on the model itself uh, here on my palette. So I can go in and the first thing I'm going to do is just make sure that, you know, any areas I want to be nice and well defined are, are like the fingies. You know, I want those, those areas to kind of stand out. The toes, even though I'll end up, I'm not going to spend too much time on the feet because uh, I'll end up putting like some probably pigment on those at the end because these guys have bare feet and walk around in the dirt. So I'm not too concerned about their feet. It's just going to be kind of dirty, dirty feet. Uh, but this lets me hit these appropriate areas, just even out some colors. If I need to get all my oranges in place, make sure everything looks right. Just some minor touches. We've also got some deep brown. Here, so I've got some like burnt umber mix. If I need to go in and reline anything, like if I want to hit those fingers, get a nice dark line between there, get those elements nice and separated, I can do so real fast. So stuff like that, go around, hit all of those, make sure I have a nice line around the eyeballs. Most of the time I do just anything. If there's a spot that kind of got overshot with the airbrush or anything like that, I can come in and correct it here very quickly. So once all that's done, then it's time to turn to our next largest element, which is these big scales that he has on his back. Uh, these guys have a whole bunch of big, giant, scaly plates uh, because, you know, they're Saurus and they're tough. So we're going to start with just a good amount of black. I've got some Pro Acryl and Abaddon black. I like both of them. One's a little satin. One cover's a little stronger. So I'm literally just going to come in and hit all of those. And as I start removing the orange, it'll actually make the orange that remains feel brighter and more impactful. It's one of the weird elements of things that we only really notice colors in when they're put against like, you know, things to contrast them. And it's one of the reasons we try to put so much contrast in our models. It creates visual interest and when you do something like run a nice dark color, against that orange, it will make the orange feel brighter because it's sitting next to something dark. A white dot just sitting on a screen of white doesn't look very bright. A white dot sitting on a screen that's completely black is very noticeable, right? So uh, just quickly work my way around the mini, hitting all of the various scaly plates that he has. I'm not worried about being too perfect. This is meant to be a speed paint. And there are like 50 of these dudes and they're just normal Saurus. So if I make a little mistake or something, honestly, who cares? Uh, one of the important elements, you know, I, I made a video recently about you don't always have to paint your best. And I think that's true. When it comes to a project like this, 
you know, this is a fun project to see, can I get something painted that's fun and looks cool that'll let me get an army on the table in 24 hours? The time is obviously arbitrary. I just picked it because it's a, it's a round number. Um, and it doesn't really matter. The point is a lot of times people beat themselves up on like having a perfect paint job on stuff that in the end, you would be much better off having more stuff painted and learning more than you would worrying about trying to get perfect base coats or something like that. That's just generally a big waste of time. If you're really concerned with painting something at a high quality, then it's more about the refinement stage when you're fixing things at the end than it is about trying to make it look perfect right up front. Okay. So, a couple little plates left. You've got a bunch of them. They're hiding all over the place, sneaky little things. So once he's got that black on there, right, you can tell how much more uh, that orange really stands out now. However, that black is a little too stark and a little too flat and a little too boring. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in uh, a little bit of blue. So I've got some Holdra blue mixed with some uh, blue-black ink. And what I'm gonna do is just kind of start lightening the edges here of some of these plates. Hit the lower sides. If I miss spots, then this will also make sure that it covers over. The reason I'm gonna go to blue here is because blue is the complementary color to orange. And as I continue to climb up the blues here in the next couple of steps, you'll see how it really makes it pop out and stand out. Having the two bright colors next to each other uh, will in the end make both of them feel more impactful. And painting something like lizard men or sore or seraphon or whatever we want to call them, the reality is it's, it's one of those chances that you, you don't always get where you can just go nuts, right? Like these guys can be so wacky colored because they're meant to be, you know, walking around talking living dinosaur lizards. Like, what a great chance to just go crazy with color schemes. Okay, so now I'm gonna mix in a little uh, Adriatic blue into something brighter. Now, on a job like this, I don't wanna mess with blending. I don't have time for it, and but I don't want it to look bad, or at least not as bad. So instead, we're gonna go for texture. So you'll notice how I, I attack this. Sorry, we would notice if I was on camera, like a dum-dum. Uh, what I'm gonna go for here is instead, you see how I'm just doing this like stippling and hashing. This, these scales have texture. So instead of trying to actually just paint them and create something smooth, I'll just hash at it or stipple at it, okay? And what that'll do is it'll make it look more like a, a natural pattern. It's a nice cheat, especially on small spaces like this. Adding texture both makes it feel more realistic because it is a natural creature and also is just faster and easier to do. So it's a win-win. We'll mix in a little bit brighter blue. So I'll take that same blue. We'll kick it up a notch with a little bit of ivory. And then we'll just very lightly hit the edges there. We're gonna need to switch brush sizes on this one. So then we can just come in there and do some nice, thin We'll do more like a Tyranid type pattern on this on his central ridge. And then on these other ones, we'll just scatter around some dots. Don't have to put them everywhere on the scales that are kind of more low down in the lower areas. Maybe we don't go as bright, you know, because those are more in shadow, so we can use that 
to our advantage. So there we go, now we got a cool pattern on him. If it's too stark, we can always go back into that original dark blue. And we can always just kind of stipple over the middle area there. And kind of create a little transition. Fast and easy, no big deal. But again, this is more about impact from, you know, a distance, and I think that looks good enough. All right, so let's keep moving around this guy. We got lots more to do, and we got like 50 of these idiots. All right, we're gonna start with all the base characters. Like, whenever I'm doing a big job like this, I'm starting with the, the base troops first. Get all my Saurus and all my Skinks done, then I can spend more time on the, the actual models. Like the characters and stuff like that that I really care about. So here I'm gonna take some black leather, hit the tongue, go around the teeth, just get that area nice and dark. Okay. As we start picking out those elements, his face will come into uh, his face will come into play. He also has a little horn. These sources have little horns on the tip of their nose. They're little like rhino sources, the old school ones. So, hit that part. Cool, good stuff, easy peasy. Uh, now we'll take a little bit of an ivory flesh tone mix. And I had hit the belly with uh, a lighter color. And so let's go ahead and keep building that up. So now we're gonna pull toward the center. And just give him a nice light little underbelly. And you notice I was constantly pulling the paint toward the middle. I got a little little bit of paint on his thumb thumb there. There we go. Wipe that away. Good to go. I can take that same color and I can go ahead and just side swipe these teeth. They're very little, but they'll respond well to just basically a side of the brush. Quick and easy. Now he's got little teethies. Arr, it's getting mean. It's getting mean. Let's take that same white mix. And this is the key, one of the keys to speed painting is stop changing paints. Use as much as you can, as often as you can. Let's get them little tiny eyeballs. For as meaty as this guy is, they do have little tiny eyes. So, now he's got some, some good eyes. Okay. While we're at it, we can take that ivory and we can hit things like this wrap down here on his club, his backup club. We can add a little extra up here to, uh, to this one. To the wrap up there, we can get the little rope that's around his belt. Again, we'll go for just sort of a light stipple on it. Doesn't really matter. It's a tiny element. Okay. We're just picking out those elements, just moving quickly. Let's take some, uh, some ink tense wood. And we'll go ahead and drop that on there in the part that's actually meant to be wood. The magic paint. Okay. Cool. Now we gotta hit this little tabard he has down here at the bottom. Uh, so for that, we're gonna go for a little bit of a, a dark green color. Just a minor complementary color to all this. 
Still has some strong blue wood tones in it. You notice I'm just working around, working quick, hitting everything I wanna hit, letting things dry, and then coming back. So go back to the tongue. Now I'm gonna go for, uh, now I'm gonna go for uh, another brighter color, uh, some Indian shadow from scale 75. And we're gonna just go ahead and trace that tongue out with a little brighter color there. Get it looking a little more, more tongue colored. I assume these guys have normal color tongues. I don't know though. You know, maybe like these lizards would have black tongues. I think a lot of creatures like that have black tongues, but yeah, I don't know. He's gonna still have a normal colored tongue. Let's go ahead and desaturate down that and highlight up this cape a little bit, or tabard, or whatever this thing is. I don't know, his little loincloth, I guess. Maybe that's what we'll call it, his loincloth. Just add a quick highlight there. Pull just a tiny amount of ivory into that. We'll hit that edge. Top part there. By desaturating the color through those highlights, we'll actually make it so it's not as contrasting because it doesn't have as much of the green in it. When we knock that green out, it becomes less contrasting. Let's use that same green mix and let's cover over his eyeballs because that'll be a nice place to hide just a little bit of that color in. All right. And having a little green tone to his eyes is more interesting. Take a little bit of that pure ivory. We'll get his toesies. Because he has little toe claws. Alright. And we can reinforce the center of his belly a little bit. Get the front teeth a little bit. So those are nice and bright. Just burning through them. Then we're gonna go ahead and finish him off. We're gonna grab a little bit of, of uh, seraphim sepia. We're gonna use this to just tint some of those ropes and toes and things like that where we don't want it to be quite so stark white. It shouldn't be that clean. Also, it'll kill the shine off of the uh, ink tense wood, which unfortunately has uh, quite a glossiness to it, but a little wash of seraphim sepia over the top will still look very much like wood, and we won't lose any of the uh, the effect. I can run along that rope that we put on there. We have a little bit of a sort of, he has like a backup rock club on his belt. So we'll hit that with some gray stone. Just literally using the black and white I already have on my palette. We'll bring in a little more black to get some more shadows. It's just a minor feature, so it doesn't need to be anything other than looking like some basic rough stone. Then finally, since his tail's over here and just kind of hanging out, we'll make sure that's a nice orange now that that's on there. And unfortunately, these old models like this, they don't have the sharpest lines between things. Like the sculpts were kind of soft. So we'll put a little black line in right there, separate the club from the tail, just so that looks more like a, a natural shadow and something that's actually two different pieces. We'll do the same thing down here on the bottom of the club there. Under the rope, just kind of build in some shadows here and there, just light touches. Separate the elements. Just quick separations like that of the various elements, especially on a fast paint job, can make a big difference. 
Um, so when you have like softer sculpts, one of the things you always want to make sure of is that you have a really clear definition between the, the elements of the miniature. It's one of those things that's little but can go a long way to making it look a lot better. And there we go. There's there he, he's ready. Everything except metallics, done and dusted. If I want to push a little farther, I could take some of that tongue red we used, plus a little bit of ivory. Maybe we give him a little bit brighter tongue. So that that looks a little more like he's got some light hitting that, that wet tongue. Bah, he's out there, out there ready to give him the lick. So, that's the plan. Now I go around and do this on every Saurus. So this is going to take a little while. Uh, you know, the, the airbrushing part was, you know, two, two and a half hours. Now comes the real where we got to tuck in because we got a lot of these guys to burn through and not a lot of time to do it. So but there you go. That's the strategy. I think he looks pretty nice. He looks for what I'm going for. He'll certainly uh, do the job. So I'm going to continue this a lot and uh, I'll be back in what will, for me will be many hours and for you will be no time at all. All right, so we're just checking in how everything's going. You can see the Carnosaur right over my shoulder there. He's hanging out. So we are currently at uh, six and a half hours, roughly. Maybe we put a pause on this. And uh, so I can eat. Uh, not making as much progress as I hoped. So it's, it's slow going at this stage because it's a lot of brush work. Um, plowing my way through as many little saurus as I can. Uh, they're coming out okay. Uh, you just watched how I was, was doing those, so that's just repeating that process lots and lots and lots of times. Uh, I've decided what I'm going to do as a strategy is I'm going to uh, do like 20 of the Saurus, because I have so many Saurus, and they're just so frustratingly deep. I'm hoping that once I finish them, the rest of the stuff will go faster. That's the hope. So I calced out exactly how many hours, and hopefully by 10 hours in, I can be done with the Saurus. What I'll probably do is break them up with some other stuff. And this is one of the things I think you've got to... This is sort of strategies for doing a lot of speed painting. When you get to a point where uh, you're really getting frustrated or tired, just put that particular element down, work on something else. Like, go grab a character, do that character real fast. And that'll break it up in the monotony. You'll work on a different thing. You have different shapes, different forms, different pieces. It changes things up. So I'll probably do the 20 Saurus. I'm rounding toward the 20 right now. And then I'll do like a monster or something. And that'll be a bigger piece, but it'll get that knocked out and I'll feel good about it. Back and forth and back and forth. I'll probably show a couple other monsters here in the video. So I'll grab some video of me working on those so you can see how I tackle the bigger things. We focused a lot on just the Saurus piece of it so far. Um, but there's obviously a lot of different forms and shapes. So I'll grab one of those and, and insert a couple of videos of those guys as I do them as well. Uh, trying to bring you along through the whole thing. Obviously, I can't paint all of this uh, on recording. That would get a bit tedious. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there's how we're going so far. Six and a half in. We're making progress. We got a long way to go. So we'll see if we can make it. Fingers crossed. All right, so we're still on the source, but I did want to take a moment to talk about actual strategy for painting. So when I say I do everything complete to the end, so that I end up with a guy that looks like this and is more or less ready to go, except the metals, that doesn't mean I only literally paint one at a time. So the other strategy you can do is you can do small groups. So here I have three, and this is how I tend to work. I have three little sticky tops, and I work like this so that my I can use a bigger brush, I can load my brush up, get everything I need done, and then I'm not, uh, and then I'm not wasting paint, and I'm not switching the color as often, right? That kind of thing. So, in other words, to to make that more real for for everybody, what I mean is I'll start with this guy. So we want to reinforce his cheeks, top of his arm, pull down the light line on there. Let's finger, blah, blah, blah. Do all the orange for that guy. Whatever that happens to be. All right, so we just work our way around. Okay, cool. 
So, yep, he looks nice and he's got his orange areas. Then I just go to the next dude, do the same thing. So the difference here is that I've got three prepped up and I'm working relatively quickly on one particular element. The reason I find this easier than just the traditional sort of uh, method you see of like, just do all the orange, then one and one and one and one and you're doing one at a time, is that one, it's a lot less rewarding. It's just, for me, it's mentally harder to get through because you don't actually see anything happen for so long. Like you have to sit there with half painted models for so long. With this method, like if I decide to stop, I've got, you know, 20 source or whatever ready to go. They're done, right? So if I say, you know what, I just can't take this part anymore right now, I'm not leaving half finished miniatures just sitting there. I've got 20 source ready to rock and roll. Now, maybe I want to do 30 more, maybe not, I don't, whatever, whatever. But it also, like, I haven't had to go back into my paint once. You haven't seen me re-wick anything. I haven't had to clean a brush. This is about the most you can do on a single brush load of paint, right? And so what that lets you get away with is a lot more speed. When you're trying to do 30 guys or 50 guys and you're just moving them along on a completely repetitive uh, factory sort of assembly line, the issue that you're going to run into is that your paint's, you know, drying on your brush. You can't sit there and do all 30 guys on one brush load of paint. So you're going to have to be rinsing your brush. You're going to have to be changing things anyways. So at that point, why not just, uh, why not just actually switch what you're doing? So the goal here is, as I said, by doing these three, I get more done quickly, but by taking them all the way through the steps, then at the same time, I still feel the, the, that little dopamine hit of a finished model. And that sounds like a joke, but it's really important because as you go through trying to do a big speed paint project like this, you need motivation. Like you need, the, you need some kind of reward system there to keep you going. And the reality is something like having finished models, you know, knowing that basically I've got 20 Saurus ready to rock and roll whenever I want is uh, is a great reward. Like I know, hey, those guys are ready, right? So at any rate, just a, a little tip of how I work. As always with this kind of stuff, your mileage may vary. I don't know, like everybody kind of has their own, their own sense of these things and what they find comfortable. So if you find the one at a time scooting over method more comfortable, then by all means do that. But hopefully this kind of, a, this will give you some alternatives to maybe give a try and see if you like it better. All right, so I'm just gonna continue on. The fight continues. See, now this is why I hate metal models, because I dropped him and sure enough, boom, there went his arms. All right, the fight continues. I thought it'd be fun to show a character. I'm working my way through the army, and so I thought let's uh, let's show how we do a tackle a, an individual character. So <clears throat> in the case of somebody like this, this is my, this is originally obviously the guy off the top of the, uh, Troglodon, if you build it that way, but I build it as the Carnosaur, so he's an extra priest. So we're going to use him as a star priest. I added some little feathers to him. And we're going to start again, like the skin more or less I was able to do with the airbrush, and I'm happy with how that came out. Like I feel like that looks good. We've got a nice lighter underbelly, you know, good highlights, good muscle definition because of how careful we were with the airbrush, so we're good to go there. So instead, what we do, and this is where when we're, when we're trying to speed paint, we want to focus on having the most impact the quickest. So here instead, we're just gonna focus on some of these, when you saw with the sauruses, I really kind of focused on every little scale, but some of these newer guys, they have a lot of different scales. And honestly, I don't wanna sit there and I don't want the pattern to be that big. It'll feel a bit overwhelming. So again, when you're, when you're trying to speed paint, when you're thinking about stuff like this, the answer is don't feel like you have to be you know, hooked or sold to any pattern. As long as your color signifiers and the elements you're using on the miniature are stable, that is to say, as long as, you know, uh, somebody can look at it and recognize sort of the pattern that there, there's visual similarities between all of them, then they're gonna feel like it's a harmonious force that belongs together. Don't beat yourself up, don't hold yourself to anything that's unreasonable. I mean, that's a good lesson just sort of in general uh, with painting, I think a lot of people when they paint, um, even if it's just an army, if they're not, you know, they're not going to a tournament, they're not trying to compete for best painted or something, they just, they get themselves into this loop where they get wrapped around the axle and think that 
only something everything has to be kind of perfect and they started something with one way and it has to look like that everywhere else that's just unrealistic a painted mini is always better than an unpainted mini and so getting your miniature painted and on the table should always be the goal okay so here i'm just getting his little thingies i realize these weren't orange so we'll go ahead and tint those some orange get that down there i left off the hands and feet some because i wanted to be able to come in and brighten them up by brush with a thinner layer and have a little more control that way i didn't get rid of the dark lines stuff like that as strongly now i'll probably still end up going back and putting a reinforcing that line but that's okay okay so now we've got that little space dark I also want to go ahead and hit the, and that's the key, I'm just always working, always moving, keeping the brush going, trying to hit all the areas that make sense. So like this big tabard that he has is going to be the same dark blue as his spot on top, or as his shell, as, um, with all the skinks I just used this kind of a signifier, they all have these kind of blue tabards. And notice that paint is going on there real, real thin. It's real liquidy. That's fine, lets me control it. It's not gonna cover in one application, and I don't care. I don't need it to. That's not what I'm on about. Let's get his little eyeballs that are showing through there. Okay. Then we can quickly work up the back scales. So we'll go into our brighter blue or mix of a little bit of Holdra and uh, an Adriatic blue. And then let's create a nice little pattern. Let's bring down some light on the top and then have a little bit underneath. Bring down some light on the top, have a little underneath. We're going to go for kind of a, a reflection type pattern on these. Make them look like they, they scintillate a little. That'll be a cool look. Okay, great, easy. Grab a slightly brighter blue, we'll go over some pure Adriatic. This time covering less, just pushing that shine. Good. Then let's go for a little bit of that Adriatic plus some white, or plus, I'm sorry, plus some bright ivory. Again, always using the same colors. Like I'm consistently using the same color. Like the bright ivory is my universal highlight color. I'm not getting out 30 different colors to work on this, right? That way the piece feels more unified. Then we'll go add just a little bit more white into that blue mix so we get something real bright. And then we're just going to go ahead and hit a little dot, little dot, little dot, little dot, little dot. So then we get a nice sort of glowing scale effect there. Looks very magical, very otherworldly, which is cool. It's good for a priest. Grab a little dark brown now that our orange is dry. We'll reinforce those fingy shadows. Hands are really important. People notice hands. Hands and faces. In this case, this guy's got a big mask on, which is gonna end up being gold. We'll take some of that brown. We're gonna create a little bit Better shadow line around his belt. Okay. Let's shove some of that brown down on the bottom of those toesies. Take a little wood, 
little bit of our ink tense wood. Let's hit his staff handle here, as well as his spear shaft down here. Okay. Now for the feathers, we want to do something nice. Generally green has been my pop color for this with like a sort of green blue. So here what we're going to do is we're going to take some, uh, just some jade green from Vallejo. Okay. And then we're going to just take that and we're going to, with a very thin wet brush, we're just going to run that right down there, use the natural shadows we got out of the airbrushing. We'll get the back side. Sorry, missed a feather. There we go. So that's good. A little bit of shade there, but we can do a little better. Let's grab a little bit of thin black blue, mix it with that green. And we'll start about halfway down the feather. There we go. Now we got, and we'll trace just a little bit up by that line. Cool. Now we got some good feathers. That was fast and easy. 10 seconds to cool looking feathers. Okay. So then we just need to get his little strippy straps. They're holding his armor in place. So we'll grab a nice dark brown. He's got little straps on the underside of his arm. Make sure we get those. Also see we're missing some orange down there on his strippy strap or on the underside of his arm, which isn't that big a deal. We'll fix it. We're gonna leave that brown on the brush. Just mix in some orange. Since these are the lower parts and they would be in shadow, so we'll let that deeper orange shadow do some work down here. Same thing with the side of the thumb and the under part of the hand there. All right, then we're gonna take a nice sharp brush, something a little bit smaller. I'm gonna grab some pure ivory. And again, on things like leather straps, the kind of thing you don't wanna spend a lot of time on, but it's gotta look more interesting. So we could, there's lots of things we could do. We could try to just highlight it and stuff like that, but that's too long when we're in a, we're in a hurry up mode. So instead we'll do something better. We'll do a little texture. I'm just gonna dab the brush around the side here real quick, and then I'm just gonna put some scritchy scratches down on one side. Just scritchy scratches, scritchy scratches, just bouncing that brush up and down. Where light catches on the top, more of like a dot along the line, but it doesn't need to be perfect. It's supposed to look messy. It's a rough leather strap. Then we, sorry, I'm out of focus there. Just scritchy scratches, dots, hashes, anything works. Just make it look like it has a little texture. Okay, so once it has a little bit of texture, then what we do is we grab something like a seraphim sepia or some kind of very light colored wash. Give that a good shake. And instead of using our wash in a traditional way where we're washing a whole area, instead we'll take a targeted amount 
and we'll just run it right over there. Use it almost more like a glaze to just bring that leather, to tint that white. That also has the advantage of, you might say, well, why didn't you just do it in a lighter brown? Well, because I want there to be the illusion of sort of layers there, and so adding more translucent layers of paint like that actually helps create a deeper looking image. Throw a little bit of that down by the base of his hand there, maybe some by the base of the foot. Just do some little tinting. When we see an opportunity to just splash some paint somewhere to good effect, hey, let's take advantage of it. Now that we've transitioned to that sharper brush, the same thing I did with the uh, the uh, the scales on his back. Let's go ahead and get the eyes here. So we'll use just a little bit of that mid-brown. Kind of hit the center of the eye. These guys have wonderful eyes. They're very expressive, very large. So we just enrich that blue. Then we're going to go up to a slightly lighter blue. Then we'll take some of that blue-white mixture and we're just going to hit the very sort of back of the eye. We want the light to gather toward the back. Okay, then we're going to take, mix a little bit of pure white into that, pure ivory, I'm sorry. And then we're just going to very carefully get a little dot right near the back. So we've got a fun little transition there, a spot in the middle. And it really seems like he's got those bright blue eyes. Go back to our other brush. Let's do the same thing down here with his tabard. We'll put a little bit of our normal blue there, basically covering everything except the deepest shadows. Hit the edge there. That's why I wasn't too worried about covering up everything earlier because I knew I was going to come back. This is a nice big flat surface, so it's going to be annoying to, to blend on, but that's okay. That just means we work nice and fast. Let's go to our higher blue. We'll have that on the edges and just the brightest spots here. Then let's grab a little bit of blue-white. And here instead, what I'm going to do, again, we're going to use our old PAL texture. So instead, sorry, I'll try to get that up to where you can really see it there. There we go. Okay. Instead of trying to highlight it, I'm just going to, with a smooth motion, We're just going to stipple some dots in. Just make it feel like it's got a little bit more texture there. And then I'll go back to my duller blue. Less white. Texture over the edge of that real quick. It's kind of like stippling type of blending, even when it's rough. Can really add a lot, and it's so much easier than trying to like slowly work up a really smooth blend. We'll go to the darker blue. That original first dark highlight we had.
Okay. And then just to kind of smooth that all out, we'll take a little bit of our original color that you saw me lay down, which was that dark black ink kind of color, the blue black Payne's gray, plus a little bit of Holdra. We'll thin that way down. Test on the back of the hand there, looks good. And then we'll just run a nice glaze of that over the edge, feather it out. Just kind of helps glaze over all our stipple. And boom, now he's got a bright, shiny cloak. <clears throat> and then the last thing we want to do is whenever we use something like uh, the uh, like the wood, like the, um, what do I want to say? I'm sorry, the um, or second to last thing, I'm sorry. Whenever we use something like the Inktense wood, it has a lot of shininess to it. We don't want that to be too shiny, so we'll just grab some Agrax, throw that over the top at the same time. You can put a little Agrax down here in his feet just to build up those shadows. He's going to be on foot. He's not going to be mounted on anything, so his feet will be dirty. He's going to be up on a, you know, kind of a little rock piece. So we'll just kind of get that down there for some dirty feet. And then we just have a couple more touches and he's good to go. So the other thing I've been doing on the skinks is... Uh, giving them a little bit of a tiger, or not tiger, I'm sorry, more of a spotted-like pattern, so we can do that on him as well. So we can just come in and very quickly around this area here. We'll just add a few spots out onto the shoulders. The reason I use things like the stippling so much when I'm trying to be fast is whenever you have like really hard, easy lines. So if you've ever blended anything and you've got like a hard line of separation, you notice that it's immediately really visible. When you have a bunch of dots, that creates visual confusion. It becomes very hard for your eye to notice inconsistencies in the pattern when things are set up like that. We're also going to hit his mouth. So that's why you see me use a lot more like stippling techniques and things like that because it's just much more difficult for the eye to pick out when something is incorrect. Also just reinforce the line around the mask there so that has a nice separation. Okay. Cool. Well, that looks good. The, let's see. We can push those feathers just a little bit more now that that glaze is dry. We'll grab some of our pure ivory. Make sure almost all of it's off the brush. And then just very lightly, we're going to just drag it up there. create a nice little uh, nice little transition and don't worry let's say you get a little too much white when you're doing something like that we'll just take a little very thin green of our original color and boom easy peasy lemon squeezy so that finishes that guy except the metals and that's so that was about 20 minutes on that guy pretty good for a character to now be done except for the metals when I come back with the metals those will be fast and then, you know, in the end, on an army like this, you have maybe four or five, six characters. So if you can get them down to 20, 30 minutes a piece, that's pretty good. You know, that feels successful to me. So that's how I'm attacking my characters. Uh, this little skinky priest is, is ready to go. Sans, he has to get golded out. All of the Seraphon characters are, of course, rocking their bling real hard. So, you know, we'll make sure he gets his, his nice bling here. I'll show you the medals in a, in a later step once I get closer to... Uh, once I get closer to the time, metals will be the very last thing I do. So that, that I always save for time in the end. So we'll pick back up in the metals in just a little while.
All right. All right, so we're 16 hours in at this point. In fact, we are 1646 in. I know that's a big time jump from the last time I checked in, but I, I got into the rhythm yesterday just and the 10 hours just flew by, literally. Uh, and I, you know, kept thinking, oh, I'll do it soon, I'll do it soon towards this next thing. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, we're not where we want to be. Uh, I underestimated the complexity of each little skink and saurus and stuff like that. But we're making good progress. So I think we'll still hit 2,000 points within 24 hours. Uh, it's just a question of whether... I, we're definitely not going to get everything I wanted painted, painted. That's not going to be possible. I was... Uh, if you've ever walked into a restaurant where you just had, and you looked at the menu, and you said, um, I, I would love to try everything. So you order all this different food, and then it shows up, and you're like, oh, I have made a terrible mistake. Well, there you go. It all looked so delicious. What could I do? Uh, but at any rate, we're going to keep pushing. I'm going to do as much as I can, uh, and we're going to see you know, if we can get uh, a, certainly a fully playable army on the table, uh, which I have full confidence in. At this point, we've already got multiple units done, battle line, characters, all the Stegadons. I'll have my... Uh, I'm just finishing up the third Stegadon. Uh, he's right here. Uh, so he's coming along real nicely. And we'll, uh, we'll certainly get to a point where we can get that battalion on the table and stuff like that. So we'll get to the 2000 and I'll see where we are. I'm going to check in some more times. Uh, we'll show you some more stuff as I'm working, as I do some more models uh but we're keeping keeping on keeping on we're gonna do as much as we possibly can we've got a little less than a third of the time left so let's do what we can shortly after i recorded the last segment i spilled an entire pot of agrax or shade right into my lap on my apron kids that's why i always wear an apron otherwise that would have been on the floor and my pants all right so we're at uh 21 hours and 13 minutes uh, and it's about to turn to the metals so we're down to the crunch time now uh, we're doing our best to get through it as much as we can uh, I'm not going to be able to I know at this point I'm not going to be able to finish everything I had laid out but good news is I will be able to finish well more than 2,000 points so that's awesome uh, I'll have a full army and then I'll have some extra stuff that I work on in the future uh, so I'm going to do uh, a video here on what I do with doing the metals fast Fortunately, these lizards don't have a ton of metal, so that's good. Uh, but next up is uh, is the metals, and then we bring it on home. So there you go. All right, we'll pick up, and you'll see what I'm doing next. All right, so now we're going to do some metals, uh, some metal paint. So here I've got my slon. It's the old school slon. You can see he's a happy little fat frog with an elvish head, uh, which is hilarious. And so we're going to put some metals on him. So what I've done, when, it, when you want to speed paint metals, I'll show you what my palette looks like over here. It's my wet palette. So down here, I have a mix of the gold that I'm using plus some dark matte brown black paint. Here I have my standard gold, here I have silver, and here I have some brown ink. Again, the key is to be able to work quickly. Uh, so let's bring back Mr. Frog. And we're going to do it on the top part here. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we, when, when it comes to metals, honestly, your, your easier answer is usually just layering up. So I'm going to leave those nice dividing lines we've gotten there, and I'm just going to very quickly run right over the top of everything. All right. And so then I get that nice. You can see that's a really deep color okay again the goal here is to be fast now at the same time I'll also hit this lower part of his headdress down here you notice on a lot of things like his hand here where he's got this bracelet I already have a nice thick black line around it going up onto the metals so that that way I can get in there get his little bracelet push that line so it's very thin, and then we still have a nice separation of the elements there. And that's a quick thing you can do when you're painting earlier. Okay, so then our next step is we go into just our pure gold. And then what we're gonna do is just create a little highlight area. So here, 
We're going to talk about the brighter parts of this headdress that would be reflecting light. So mainly bringing up toward the top. I'm just using the sharp side of the brush, drawing the paint in the direction I want it to gather. All right. So now we get that nice, bright, shiny gold reflectiveness there. Then I'm going to take just a touch of that gold, but mostly silver. Thin it a little bit down with some water. And then I'm going to pick a spot right along the top where the light would be reflecting. And we're just going to nab each of those spots. I see some people afraid to use a more pure silver in golds. I say, no way, Jose. Bright polished gold still reflects near white light and white light in true metal paints is silver or chrome paints. So there we get a nice reflection line across the top, All right? We can do the same thing on the bracelet. Where we just kind of put in some areas where it would be reflecting. In general gold, it's not our shadow. Pull that same silver color, thin it down a little, and then let's just put a little light spot right up there. Now, I mentioned earlier there was some ink. What are we gonna do with that ink? Well, we're gonna take that burnt umber ink, or any kind, you can use any kind of sepia or brown or anything like that. Again, we're gonna thin it down with just a little bit of water there. Nothing too, piss, nothing too spectacular. Give a test on the back of our hand, looks nice. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna reinforce those shadows along the backside. I'm trying to make sure his chair doesn't get in the way. So I'm just gonna come in and let that, that ink, which inks are nice and shiny. We're not washing this or anything like that. We're just adding that rich tone right in there. And then we get a really nice, we can also add in between the lines, to create a little bit of shadow. We get that really nice effect. You can always add it a couple times if you want to. You could do a few depending on how fast you're trying to be. But that's it. And you can see how nice and rich and like polished gold that headdress looks now. So now I just gotta do that to the rest of Mr. Fat Frog. Uh, he's being carried around by a, by a Croxagor, by the way, because uh, I lost his original uh, floaty thing. So instead, he's just being carried around by a Croxagor, which I thought was funny. Um, so with that, uh, that's going to be the last part of this as we're coming down to the very end. So uh, I'll be back in a moment with how this all turned out. All right, that's it. We're done. It's been It has been a rough 24 hours, but we made it. So, uh, at this point, we are at 2340, and uh, we're going to call it right there, because uh, there's nothing else I can do of value in that time. So, this has been a really intense project. Uh, I will call it a partial success, partial failure. I don't know. I'll let you be the judge. How about that? Uh, so, I'll show you what all I finished. That'll be right up. Sorry, right this hand. It'll be right up here. This is what I finished. And so what you can see there is two regular Stegodons, my Stegodon with uh, Skink Chief and uh, the uh, a full hunting pack of three Salamanders, 20 Skinks, uh, 20 Saurus, uh, the uh, a Slon, uh, a Skink Starsteer, a Skink Priest, and a Saurus Old Blood and a Saurus Scar Veteran. So, uh, you know, pretty good there, all considered. Oh, sorry, and five Saurus Knights, my, my teeny weenies raiders. Yes, there you go. I had to look behind me at where they are just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, so, all in all, a good, uh, a, a, I think, a good effort. Unfortunately, this is what I didn't get painted in time. So, again... Got to get the right hand. This one up here. So, what's left? Well, quite a bit. Ten regular skinks, ten chameleons, uh, my uh, Saurus uh, old one on Carnosaur, and 30, 30 Saurus. That's quite a lot I didn't get in. Now, uh, I'll say with the battalion that I wanted to run, I did get the army I wanted done. So I got 2,230 points done, let's call it, roughly. Uh, depends on kind of, you know, you could, we could make it 2,280 if I bought an extra command point or endless spells or whatever, you know. 
because obviously those are all still things I have painted and could just take and don't cost anything. Uh, so all in all, there's still a lot more to add. Uh, I will probably continue working on this stuff over the rest of the week and see if I can just push through and get it done this week. But to get, I think, a full 2,000 point army painted in 24 hours, I feel pretty good about that. Uh, there were a couple accidents, as you saw with uh, the spill of, a, of a, uh, a full bottle of Agrax Earthshade. So that's now completely empty since I dumped that all in my lap. That's fun. Uh, this is my, by the way, this is my uh, paint water, what it looks like right now after this. Pretty gross. A lot of real, that looks absolutely horrendous. So let's put that away, put that away. Okay. Uh, all in all, this was really fun. Uh, I got the chance to work quick, to work fast, to experiment with some stuff, and to get an army on the table. Uh, one thing I'll say from what you can see with it sitting up there in that photo of what I got finished is it kind of looks boring because it's, it looks like a lot of orange. So let's look at it again with the bases. So here's what it looks like on their bases. I think that looks a lot better. Now, I have to note that uh, I didn't have time to put them on their bases in here. But again, the challenge was paint an army in 24 hours not also get that army based so look i'm the one who's made the rules i can break them if i want uh but i so as that picture you're seeing that was done after this 24-hour period after i'm technically recording this uh but i think they look really nice for what they for what they are for a speed painting project uh and the reality is Sometimes it's okay to just do less than your best and have fun. A painted model is always better than an unpainted model. I've been trying really hard recently to push on that theme because I think it's really important. The reality is, is that there, we all have a bunch of shelves of shame. And sometimes we get over-invested in individual things. Like we have to make everything perfect. It has to be done. It doesn't really have to be often. Uh, sometimes just having a fun army that you're painted that you can have fun with and on the table is great. If it's your first army, don't sweat it too much. Get it painted. By the time you're done with it, you'll learn so much. You know, you'll your future armies will look ten times better and you'll do them in half the time. If it's your tenth army, maybe don't worry about it as much. It's your tenth army. The point is no matter where you are, you can always choose to have fun. And you can always choose to just do something that's going to get your models painted. And sometimes if you really, really love a force and you want to invest months into it, that's okay too. You can just invest that time. You know, that was my Slanesh for me. The Lizards, I wanted to play this army. I thought it was cool. I thought it was fun. But I'm not hung up on it. It's just going to be a fun army I can put on the table with some friends and have a good beer and pretzels game. And that's what you ultimately want. Uh, so there you go. That was the challenge. Uh, it, all in all, I'm very happy with uh, how it came out, but never satisfied. We'll do this again at some point in the future, I'm sure. So, uh, but if you liked this, uh, obviously I tried to shrink this down, do a lot of editing, really make this more coherent. Um, please tell me if you liked this format better. This took a lot longer to put together, obviously, to both do and then put together so I can't do these often uh, between the prep work and the actual painting, which was 24 hours of, you know, paint work over three days and then all the editing and everything. This is, you know, more work, but it was a lot of fun. So tell me if you like the stuff I added here. I'm trying to learn more to how to use the software and tools that I have available. Uh, if you did like it, hey, hit that like. I really do appreciate that. That helps other people find this video, other people find this channel, uh, which I really, really deeply appreciate. Uh, but as always, uh, subscribe for more Hobby Cheating. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you've got suggestions for future topics you'd like me to tackle, please do put that down below. Uh, I always respond to every comment. So thank you very much to everybody who encouraged me when I said I was thinking about doing this. Thank you all very much for watching. It is greatly appreciated. And as always, we'll see you next time.